Good morning, um, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. My heart is racing. Um, yes, Her Excellency, the President of Chile, Michelle Bachelet, we welcome you to this debate with great pride and honor. In December 2013, you won a landslide victory in the first ever presidential race between two women candidates, giving her a second term in the top decision-making position in Chile. This is your second term of office. Prior to being elected in December 2013, you took on the position of the first head of the newly established UN Women, a new agency that was created to profile gender issues and women's issues. This organization is currently being run by the former Vice President of South Africa, Pumzilom Nambo Muka. I'm also aware of your history in uh, Chile's contested, as many political histories are contested. President Bachelet was herself arrested, tortured, and exiled between 1973 and 1990 during the dictatorship of General Augusto Pinochet. And so has a long history of political Radicalism, if I can call it that. Besides naming the first cabinet, one of the first, perhaps the first cabinet with gender parity, she has also given visibility in her speeches and in, uh, I would call it, political and grounded activism um, on gender equality. And this conversation that she has made prominent still exists and persists in Chile. In her accomplishments include the 2008 reform of the pension system in Chile, which introduced a basic pension for poor homemakers who have never earned a wage outside the home, as well as a stipend per child for all mothers. Another flagship program of our administration which has been replicated in other countries in the region is the integral protection system. She has also um, 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 made strides in terms of early childhood and um, a program called Chile Grece Contigo. I'm not sure of the pronunciation. Chile grows with you. And this is a program that provides supports for parents and children from conception through to age four. Madam President, during our pre-conversations as we're waiting for you to come, uh, one of the people in the audience menaced, ma uh, mentioned the kind of uh, innovative work you've been doing in reproductive health for women in Chile, providing um, contraceptive care and also medication in the event of violence and rape and sexual violence. Other major gains for women in her government include the large number of free day, centers, free day centers and nursery schools established throughout the country, which have given women more freedom to enter the labor market and a law, labor market and a law aimed at bridging the gender wage gap um, that uh, Gracia Michelle mentioned. Um, we, we are making progress legally, but still practically yet to make progress. And, um, this uh, gender wage gap also grants labor benefits to domestic workers, another area of the labor force that is still across the world uh, dominated by women. I'm sure there is more to say about Her Excellency. And we're really honored to have you present to share some of the recent work that you've been doing, but also to give input on this conversation we're having here in South Africa, what does it mean to make substantive gender justice possible? Thank you very much. Let's welcome Her Excellency to the podium.
Well, thank you so much. And because I'm late, I couldn't change my clothes because we're coming from Robben Island. And of course of that, I'm not gonna say the whole name of the people who are here. So we're gonna say all protocols observed and dear friends, and we'll include everyone in dear friends. Uh, you just mentioned part of my history, of my, the things I've done in life, but I just wanna st start saying, I have done a lot in my life in social matters, in health, pension, childcare. I was the first female uh, Minister of Health of my country, but probably nobody would have seen me as a possible president if it weren't because I was also the first female Minister of Defense. And I'm saying this because we're talking about power, Grasa was telling us. And I'm saying that because it's not only having the truth or being right what will permit women to play the role and to have the opportunities and ensure the rights I should. We need to do much more than that. Just to be the right position is not enough in the world. And it has always been like that, and you know it so well from your own history. So having said that, let me say that it is a special honor for me, this getting together with all of you the day after celebrating uh, National Women's Day recognizing um, uh, those women who bravely uh, mobilize and stand against arbitrary discrimination and oppression of the apartheid, but demonstrating the action slogan that women really do have the strength of a rock. And I do believe that women have the strength of a rock. So that's why when we're discussing you and women, uh, because it was supposed to be uh, you and women, that was the short name for the UN, Women's Organization for Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment. But to be honest, I don't think we need to empower women because women are powerful. What we need to do is to enable all the conditions so those powerful women can really do what they want to do in terms of politically, uh, socially, economically, etc. Having said that, let me start with three ideas. The first is that when you look at the history of the world, of course we can say there has been important progress made on equality struggles over the past decades. Second, that we have a lot pending task, none of them which can be put off any longer. And third, equal, inclusive, or harmonic development is not possible in the world if we do not put gender equality at the top of the list of challenges that we states and NGOs and universities, et cetera, of the world must address. And listening to, to Grasa, she mentioned two essential issues that we need to deal much better with it because we're yet far away where we should be. And you mentioned race and gender. And I was thinking and that could, we could also include it in diversity because we are not dealing well with diversity. Could it be ethnical diversity? Could it be sexual orientation? Could it be uh, all kinds of diversity in the world? And we're not dealing well with that either. Um, yes, we have had progress on health and education in the world history in the last decades, if we compare it. But poverty has mainly a female face. 800 women still die daily while given birth. Um, Still today, women's presence in higher education, politics, and paid employment remains the minority. Or I should say, women in decision-making position, still very rare. And in Latin America, for example, 85 women die, when you take the, the rate of uh, maternal mortality, 85 in 100,000 births, women die, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's 646 every 100,000 births. In the female workforce, 53% of the developed world, I mean the female are 53% of the task force, of the workforce, 26 in the Middle East and North Africa. In Chile, it's in between, 42. And uh, in order to get there, we had to include a lot of different policies. Policies towards children, childcare, and others that would permit really women to have access to, to work in adequate condition. 
In education in the developed world, nearly all girls reach primary education. In sub-Saharan Africa, 42% no more than four years of schooling, and in South Asia, 35% in the same condition. So what is my conclusion about this? It's not only that we have a lot of pending tasks, but also is that egalitarian struggle show very different results in different parts of the world. So we need to have strategies for a double inequality. The inequality in each country between men and women, and it's completely truth. There's no country in the world that is equal pay to equal job. Neither in the Nordic countries that are supposed to be the more advanced in terms of, of rights. So everybody has to do much better on gender issues. But having said that, of course, there are countries with much, much terrible condition for women. So we need to have, as I said, a, a different strategies for the double inequality, the relation with and, and the opportunities and the rights of women and men, but also the relationship on women between countries or inside the countries. The majority of the countries have ratified the CEDAW Convention, and half, more than half here in, in Africa have ratified the protocol of the right of the women in Africa. Yet, Rasa was remembering us that even though we have this important amount of legal frameworks, laws, conventions, etc., um, we don't haven't advanced in the same rhythm. I would say we discuss a lot and we work a lot on this on, in, in UN Women. When you look at violence against women, is worldwide. Violence against women, you will see it in rich people, poor people. You will see it in very educated family and with no education. You will see it in all parts of the world. So what is what we're doing wrong? Or what is what we haven't addressed yet? I don't have the answer, I'm sorry to say, otherwise probably I will win the Nobel Prize. But, uh, but I have some, some ideas anyway. Um, because as I said, we still have big inequalities. I think one of the things, it happens not only with gender issues, but it used to happen more with gender issues because sometimes people in parliaments, in governments, they do understand they need to do much more for women but not necessarily that is completely embodied. So what's happened is that you have a good law, but there's no budget for it. So there's no way to implement it. Or you have a law, you have a budget, but you don't have really the political will. So there's so many factors you have to deal with in terms of making that legal framework work for women adequately. Or some other times the laws are look in a partial way and not in a comprehensive way. One of the things that I concern about, for example, in violence against women, because we're not talking here about rocket science. We know what works on violence against women. But there are some things that probably we're not doing yet. It's not only about prevention, about um, uh, pro pro promotion of uh, healthier uh, forms of relationship between children and for me, one important thing of the nurseries that we develop in my country is I think you, from the beginning, from the very early stages, you need to develop a culture of relationship, of respect between people. Men, women, girls, boys, diversity and respect for diversity in, 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 in our societies. Um, one other thing is that we are leading sometimes to the consequences but we're not leading with the factors leading to discrimination, leading to violence uh, or abuses. Because we all know that violence is not, and particularly sexual violence, is not about sex. It's about power. It's about domination or sometimes humiliation even when we're talking about sexual violence in war, as a, as a mean of war. Um, but there's still a lot of things that I think we haven't touched yet. And the thing is that there's no one, not only is there one, no one size fits all, but there's no one recipe or no one tablet that will solve the problem. 
We need to have a comprehensive approach. We need to deal with many difficult, different things. And of course, we need women leaders, role models, strong women that can show that women can. It's amazing that we need to demonstrate that in the world, but still it's like that. Um, you know, in Chile, we have advanced. This is my second term. I, we skip a period because in my country we cannot be re-elected immediately. Uh, and now you have a women, female president of the republic. We have right now the female president of the Senate. We have a female as in the biggest confederation of trade unions in my country. And we have female at the biggest uh, uh, students association of the biggest university of my country. So you look at that, you say, okay, that's the perfect world for women. Not yet. <laughs> we have only 17% of female in parliament. So, uh, so the thing is that because we have all these women, I'm sure it will be faster, we will be move faster. And for the first time this year, we will be able to put in place a quota law for women. Because for many years I've been trying to do that, I never had the support from the political parties. But now, and I think it's because women, we have been paving you know, the way that now it's impossible for them to say no anymore and to have good arguments. So what I'm saying is that even though things are not as we would like, we are being improving and we need to continue improving. But there's other things that are invisible. And Feminist groups and women most move moves and has been speaking for so long about glass ceiling. But what do we know now? That glass ceiling, yes, but it's not only glass ceiling. It's a leaking pipeline. It's invisible bias. And there is a fantastic work on Harbor Business Review that shows how it works. They said that this was an organization who wanted to promote somebody. And they interview a woman and a man. So the women did the interview, the panel said, oh, she has fantastic performance records. Her interview was not that good. She's insecure. Then come the man and they said she had, he had fantastic records of performance. His interview is not that good. He has potential. So it's not a joke, it's reality. And when I told this to the head, the new female head, of the national television in France. She said, oh my God, I just did that last week. <laughs> this woman she interviewed, she was telling her, you know what, I'm good at this, but this is not my best part. I have to tell you and so on and so on, but I'm very good at that. So she said, oh, she's insecure. And then come this guy like that. I'm the one you need, you know. <laughs> I'm the perfect one for the job. And she said, great, I got that. And, and, and it's reality. And you live it as a reality. And as a president for so many much time, people would say, she's so nice, she's charismatic, but nothing about my ideas, my proposals, the policies that I wanted to implement. So that intention to invisibilize women, to deny their capacities is there. And you have to work with that and struggle with that. Why I mention this leaking pipeline and, and bias, because we need to go deeper and see and, and see not only the consequences and some roots, but that we know and many has been written and many has been researched. But I think we need to have a more comprehensive approach in order to really move faster. One of the things that is not easy at all is politics. Uh, I would say, and I come from politics, so it's not that this woman came here to talk about politicians, but I can tell you it's one of the hardest part. And probably because uh, politics has been in the hands of men traditionally. Uh, but it's in, it, it is very important. And in the, in the world, we have 70% of female ministers, 17, one seven. When in the world, probably women are majority, like 51%. And it's only 22% of female parliamentarians. It has increased though but it increases at a rhythm like 1% in, in five years and many years. So, what to do about that? 
when I was executive director of UN Women and I had to promote and to, if I would say, sell the idea, uh, I was asking myself, I come from the political world, how should I speak to the politicians? Because at the end, it is at the personal level, but you need to be able to grab that opportunity at the personal level. You need to have a real environment that will permit that. Because otherwise, there will be women in very spectacular position, but there will be exceptions, cases. So we need to continue doing all that we have talked about it in an adequate way. Of course, all the legal frameworks, and usually you need to update them. For example, we are updating now our law against violence against women because we have found some gaps that we need to solve adequately. We need more powerful women in leading positions because they are role models for other women. And in my country, uh, when I was a kid, I would have never thought to be a president, even two years before being a president, I never thought I was going to be a president, to be honest. But it was not in my dreams, if I would say. But now many girl, little girls in my country said, auntie, because they said auntie to the older people, we want to be a, I want to be a president in the future. So you're opening the possibilities of everything is possible. Um, of course, one of the other things that's very important, not every woman is gender sensitive. And being in Davos, there was this business women, and they told me, I'm successful because I'm good, not because I'm a woman. And I would tell him, I was elected president because I'm good, but because I was in that position, I wanted not to lose any other good women in my country, so to give them the opportunities, ensure the rights. But you cannot imagine how many women are not gender sensitive. They don't see the obstacles, maybe because they had a privileged life, and that's okay. But the truth is, and why I'm mentioning is because we need men on board, and one of the things is we don't need only women talking about women. We know everybody committing and talking and, and looking and acting how we improve women's life because it's uh, men and women's life, but particularly we're talking today about gender issues. But um, we need to network. We need to work together. Women need to de develop more solidarity with others. If there are new people in town, in business and so on, to mentor others and to, re to organize uh, our groups and as, as Grasa was telling us, to outreach, social outreach, to, to move. Um, and we need more economic, social, and political empowerment. Education is essential. All the studies in Latin America shows that the future of a little boy a in a rural area in Latin America, the main factor that will help them be somebody that he wants really to be in the future is the education of the mother. And these are really new studies, and very and a lot of them. So it's essential. And, and finally, I would say uh, to generate the, all the conditions for women to be able to make decisions in all dimensions of this life. But again, essentially, what we need, and that's the more difficult part, and that's what laws don't change. It's a cultural change. It's a cultural change in terms of the role, the figure, how we understand the role of human beings and women there as a human being with all the rights and opportunities that we all deserve. But for that, first, we need to not only laws, but also what I call symbolic gestures. I mean, it's true. It's not only that I was Minister of Defense. Some people say there was this flaws, flaws in, the, in, in the city and then I went to be, as a Minister of Defense, I went to go around to see what was going on. And because we were sending our, the people from the conscription to help, you know, take the water out of the houses and the mud and so on. So the general said to me, Madam Minister, it's very difficult to get there. Please, let's go in a tank. So I stood up in the tank and then this, photo, this guy took a foot of me. First, in the, in the newspaper, the photo of me, you know, like with uniform in a tank. I'm not proposing all women to do that. <laughs> I just want to tell you that many of my friends who wanted to be president, they will ask me, can you lend me a tank, please? Because maybe what I mean to tell you is that there are some powerful symbolism that I think 
it, not, it doesn't need to be a tank. I'm not talking, but in my case, it's what everybody said, that everybody look at me with different eyes, you know? Oh, come on, she can make it. She can deal with the militaries. So maybe she's powerful enough to be president of the Republic. There's other kind of symbolic things, but what I'm saying is not only about laws, we need to go more f further, and we need to find other issues. But finally, laws, symbolic gesture, role models, but women as active citizens. And, uh, and, and, and in the, um, because on the personal level, you also have to do all those things. You have to have a gender perspective. You have to raise your kids with, with real values of equality and human rights, uh, but you also need a society that gives you all the opportunities so you can really have the life we all deserve. Thank you very much.